Yeah, it's Thursday morning. Welcome to Superior Court, Keene, New Hampshire. We're gonna go upstairs and uh, and they're gonna try me for uh, criminal trespass, which is uh, standing on public property. Uh, yeah, standing on public property. All right. Uh, good morning. This is a matter of the state of New Hampshire versus James Johnson. The court today is a jury trial. It's a court's understanding that Attorney Wave, you had some preliminary matters you wanted to discuss before the jury was down. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Just one. That being that the witnesses should be sequestered, the state's witnesses will be out of the courtroom until they testify. The state would just ask the court to uh, make certain that the defense witness is also outside the courtroom until he testifies. Any questions, Mr. Johnson? Kind of question? You have a witness? Yes. Is he outside the courtroom? Yes. Excuse me? He's in here. So okay, he'll, he'll leave at this point? You need to wait outside and, and uh, someone will come out and call you when it's your turn to testify. Uh, any other matters? No, thank you. Okay, okay Joe, sorry, bring them up. All rise for the jury. Jerry, Your Honor. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing. Mr. Johnson, please remain standing. The rest of you may be seated. Mr. Johnson, please face the jury. Ladies and gentlemen, the jury, will you raise your right hand and keep them raised during the oath? And at its conclusion, you will each say, I will. Do you solemnly swear or affirm? that you will carefully consider the evidence and the law presented to you in this case, and that you will deliver a fair and true verdict as to the charge or charges against the defendant. So help you. I will. Members of the jury, you may be seated. Will the defendant please remain standing while the complaint is read to the jury? Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, will you please listen to the complaint, docket number 10 CR 887, which charges that James Johnson of Winchester, New Hampshire, did on April 25, 2010, commit the offense of criminal trespass contrary to the statute and the laws of New Hampshire, for which the defendant should be held in answer, in that the defendant did commit the crime of criminal trespass, in that he knowingly remained on the property of 825 Marlboro Road, Cheshire County House of Corrections in defiance of an order to leave, which he was personally communicated to him by an authorized person to wit, Sergeant Frank DeTouris, knowing that he was not licensed or privileged to remain against the peace and dignity of the state. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the defendant James Johnson has been arraigned on the complaint and has pleaded not guilty. And of this, he places himself before you, the jury, for the trial.
John Webb of the Cheshire County Attorney's Office has joined the issue for the state, and you, the jury, are to say by your verdict, if the defendant, James Johnson, is guilty of the offense where he stands charged or not guilty. Listen carefully to the evidence. Mr. Johnson, you may be seated. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. As you may remember, I'm Judge Arnold. Uh, before we begin the trial this morning, there was some preliminary matters I want to need to review with you. Uh, as I indicated at the time you were selected, this is anticipated to be a one-day trial. Uh, we will take a mid-morning, mid-afternoon recess, obviously a luncheon recess. However, if during the course of this trial you have any problems or difficulties, please bring it to my attention or to the bailiff's attention, uh, and we will try to address it. Uh, witnesses in all criminal cases are sequestered, which means they wait outside the courtroom so that they cannot benefit from hearing the testimony of those who precede them. That's the normal case. You're not cons to consider anything uh, about it. Uh, as I will caution you throughout the trial, uh, so at the times we take recesses, you cannot talk about the evidence of the case among yourselves. You can only do so at such time as the evidence has been completed and you're deliberating as a whole. So. Uh, I also will tell you that you're not free to do any independent research uh, in this case. This means that during the trial you must not conduct any independent research. Uh, in, as to the matters in this case and as to the individuals involved in this case, in other words, you should not consult dictionaries or reference materials, search the internet, websites, blogs, and use any other electronic tools to obtain information about this case or to help you decide this case. Uh, you are the sole and exclusive judges of the facts, and the only evidence that you can consider in deciding what the facts are in this case is the testimony that you hear in the courtroom today, both on direct and, on direct and cross examination, regardless of who calls the witness, and any exhibits that may be admitted into evidence. Uh, it's very important that you follow that, that instruction. Uh, I guess with that said, uh, we're ready to proceed with opening statements. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is John Webb. I'm the prosecutor in this case. We're here serving on the jury in the case of the State versus James Johnson. Mr. Johnson is charged with a misdemeanor criminal trespass. People who are charged with misdemeanors are entitled to jury trials, as well as people who are charged with felony. The charge and the trial relate to an incident which took place April 25, 2010 at the Cheshire County House of Corrections in Keene at 825 Marlborough Road. You're going to hear from five witnesses for the state. Uh, you've already heard the charge. Mr. Um, Johnson is charged again with a misdemeanor criminal trespass in that he knowingly remained on the property of 825 Marlboro Road, Cheshire County, House of Corrections, in defiance of an order to leave, which was personally communicated to him by an authorized person, to wit, Sergeant Frank Deturis, knowing he was not privileged or licensed to remain. So that's the charge, <coughs> Mr. Mayor. Um, you're going to hear from five witnesses for the state, as I said. We hear from Major John Musso, who is an employee at the Cheshire County House of Corrections. We're going to hear from uh, three other employees of the Cheshire County House of Corrections. Sergeant Frank Deturis, who was mentioned in the complaint, who was working that day, April 25, 2010. We're going to hear from two other officers of the House of Corrections who uh, assisted in this case, who were also working on that day, April 25, 2010. Uh, they are Arthur Coyle and Sandra Fallon, again, employees of the House of Corrections. Finally, you're going to hear from James Semorellis, a sergeant with the Keene Police Department. He responded that day to the House of Corrections um, and ultimately arrested the defendant and a group of other people. You're going to learn from these witnesses a number of things. I won't go over all of them here. But what you will learn is uh, the Cheshire County House of Corrections, like, like any county House of Corrections, houses uh, a population of, of inmates. Some are pretrial people, some are sentenced on misdemeanors. 
uh, in the House of Corrections. You're going to hear about specifically the facility at 825 Marlborough Road in Keene, the, the House of Corrections, um, sort of the layout of the House of Corrections, the drive up, the signs that are posted. There are no trespassing signs posted on the property. You'll get a chance to see a picture of one of those signs. They, <coughs> on April 25th, 2010, those signs said, warning, all visitors must check in. This is a secure government facility. Trespassers are subject to arrest and prosecution. Defiance of any order to leave is a misdemeanor. And then the notice is posted pursuant to statute. Those signs, uh, you'll hear where they were on the property and so forth. You're going to learn that on that day, <coughs> in the uh, late afternoon, early evening, a group of people began to assemble at the House of Corrections, a crowd of folks, um, that they sort of hung out in the parking lot for a while, and the group got bigger, and they began to mill about the, the House of Corrections grounds, going around the House of Corrections. You'll, you'll in fact, see a video that was preserved that came from the surveillance system of the House of Corrections. We learned from Musso that there is, in fact, a series of cameras that records what happens. And so you're going to get to see a lot of this. Um, we'll fast forward through a lot of it uh, so that you're not bored from watching too much. Um, and you'll see that these folks went, these people went around the House of Corrections, they went up to the building, they crossed uh, through the areas where the signs warned them about no trespassing. What's more, you'll learn that uh, Sergeant Deturis consulted with Major Musso, who consulted with the superintendent, who's sort of in charge of the House of Corrections. And the decision was made based on their conduct and what they were doing, that they should be ordered to leave. And they were ordered to leave. Here from Sergeant Deterris that he went outside and addressed the crowd. With him were officers Coyle and Fallon, and they will confirm that Deterris told the crowd they had to leave. One of the people in that group was the defendant. Uh, you will note, and I will let you see it on the video here from the witnesses, that he is somewhat distinguishable by what he's carrying. Um, and I'll save that for the for the evidence. They were told they had to leave. In no uncertain terms, very clearly, they were told more than once they had to leave. Now, some of them did leave. They worked their way back to the parking lot, down the entrance road, um, but some of them did not leave. Meanwhile, the Keene Police Department was called to respond just in case there problem with these people because there was a fair number of them and they were milling all around the property. So the Keene police show up among them are uh, is James Simarellis, the Keene sergeant that I mentioned. When he's there, a group of these same people that had been told they must leave and get off the property came back up the road and just kept walking, marched around, the, walked around the House of Corrections, again passing these no trespassing signs, and in defiance of that order from the tourists that had just been given to them, that they have to leave. They go around the House of Corrections again, come back to, around the back side, and hang out in the parking lot, given many opportunities to leave. In fact, some of them took the opportunity to leave at that point. Others, including the defendant, stayed. They were arrested for criminal trespass, having been ordered to leave. That is the case. It's a misdemeanor. Uh, you're gonna, like I said, you're going to see the video. Um, certainly not the crime of the century, but you will uh, understand that there are security concerns that the House of Corrections has, that they can't have people milling around the building. The evidence is going to show the state will argue that the defendant committed the crime of criminal trespass, the misdemeanor. Uh, the law, you will learn from the judge. 
<coughs> he's the one that at the end of the case instructs you on the law and you have to follow his instructions. They control. I'd like to give you a brief summary uh, now so you can have it in mind as we go into the trial. This is the criminal trespass statute. A person is guilty of criminal trespass if knowing that he is not licensed or privileged to do so, he enters or remains in any place. Criminal trespass is a misdemeanor if the person knowingly enters or remains in any place in defiance of an order to leave or not to enter, which was personally communicated to him by the owner or other authorized person. That's criminal trespass. By the end of the case, after you hear the evidence, the state uh, will argue that it shows that the defendant committed the crime, the misdemeanor crime of criminal trespass, and that you should find him guilty. So thank you in advance for your patience. Um, and the defense, defendant who's representing himself in this case will now have an opportunity to present an opening as well. <coughs> Mr. Johnson. <coughs> Good morning. Good morning. My name is James Johnson. Uh, thank you all for being here. I, I believe uh, that uh, if any of you had your choice, you would not be here. The state has ordered you to be here. Uh, they have uh, brought you here, told you where you can park, told you where you should stay, brought you in here told you where you should sit. And as a final insult, when they mocked you in here for jury selection, all you had was a number on your chest. The reason you had a number was because they, uh, they didn't have enough money to separate your names and give you the dignity of your name. I'm faced with a year in jail as a penalty for this. Yes, and you're on okay. I've given uh, this man a, a great deal of leeway in his presentation. Mr. Johnson, why don't you approach? you uh, during the course of my instructions at the conclusion of the trial, any punishment that may or may not result from a finding of guilty in this case is not to be considered by it's irrelevant and it's inappropriate to have introduced it in an opening statement. You may proceed, Mr. Dennis. Almost 500 years ago, not quite 500 years ago, a man posted the uh, list on a church door in Germany. His name was Martin Luther. He was rebelling against a royalty. Things that he thought were wrong. And he did so with not only the penalty of his life, but of excommunication. Which means he is He's separated from God, the man with the priest, monk. From that posting, the Protestant religion was uh, brought about. The Protestants, notable in uh, court cases, Northern Europe and England, would not take off their hat for a judge would not bow before royalty. These people were faced with not only death, but torture before they were killed. I mentioned that uh, you were ordered to do things, brought about, taken, uh, given a number. Because of the royalty I see in today's world, and the charges here are, are very minuscule. Out walking around a public building, a fortress, if anybody can call it any less. <coughs> mm -hmm. 
you're actually part of something uh, pretty grand. We have a judge named Arnold. In German, Arnold means powerful eagle. Represents our government. We have a prosecutor named Webb. Draw your own conclusions. We have a set of people waiting for change in the world. And we have you, the people who will either say that change will come or change will not. So you're actually part of something pretty huge. The prosecutor has said that he will bring five witnesses before you to say that I was ordered, personally ordered to uh, leave the property. All five of those witnesses will before you tell you that they did not personally tell me to get off the property. Every single one of them. You will also be told that I did not have permission to be on the property. We'll see how many times anybody has been given permission to be on county property at the correctional center. How many people call beforehand to visit a prisoner? The written permission, verbal permission, anything at all. And we'll see what their answer is to that. I would hope that you would uh, find me not guilty, since the state only gives you two choices, guilty or not guilty. They restrict you in that manner too. They tell you that you cannot make up your own decision for any reason, and that's false. You, as a jury, make the decision in this case without any consequences from anyone. And I would hope you would uh, be unanimous in my uh, innocence. And uh, if uh, Mr. Webb is, uh, hurry up, I, I think we can be out of here by 11. Thank you very much. I'd like to indicate, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in my preliminary comments that we finished up a trial yesterday, and there was a jury deliberating on another case, which may cause me to be interrupted in the course of this trial. I apologize for any interruption that occurs, uh, but I meant to mention that to you at the outset. Uh, Attorney Webb. Thank you, Your Honor. The state calls John Musso. Go to the front, remain standing, and raise your right hand, please. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the penalties and pains of perjury? Yes, I do. Please have a seat. State your full name and please spell your last name for the record. My name is John Musso, last name M O U S S E A U. Tell the jury, please, what your current occupation is and what your title is. I'm the Director of Safety and Security at Cheshire County Department of Corrections. How long have you been employed at the Cheshire County House of Corrections? A little over 15 years. Okay. The House of Corrections in Cheshire County, where is that located? That's in Guarantee, and it's on 825 Marlboro Road. Okay. Go into just a little bit with the jury briefly what your general duties are at the House of Corrections. Um, as a director of safety and security, I oversee all the safety and security. That includes all the cameras, the phones, the electronic surveillance equipment. What is the, and again briefly, what is the command structure at the House of Corrections? How is it run? It's the superintendent, 
and then there's four different directors. I'm one of the directors. We range from different ranks. There's three of them that have the rank of captain. I have the rank of major. Okay. So where, where does that make you fit into the command structure? I'm basically the second in command. Some of these five folks may not know uh, how it's laid out. Why don't you briefly explain to them the Cheshire County House Corrections in team. Just um, explain to them how it's laid out from when you drive in to just the general layout of the building and what's around the building. So you drive in, you come down a driveway, a long driveway, you come enter in, we have a sally port where law enforcement vehicles go into like a garage, then off to the left is a parking lot, public parking lot. If you went to the right, there's a little circle. That's where the front entrance door is to the jail. Around the jail, what do we find around the building itself? There is a road that goes all the way around the outside of the jail, and that's posted with signs that will be back there. Okay. generally is housed in the House of Corrections. In other words, who's inside? Besides the command structure that you just talked about. So the inmates. Inmates? Exactly. Yes, we, so we house inmates. There's both county inmates that have been sentenced there to a year or less, and there's inmates that are waiting pretrial, um, could be going to the state prison, things of that nature, and there are some federal inmates. And uh, it fluctuates, I'm sure, but at uh, any given time, approximately how many inmates do you have incarcerated there in the house? About 140 or so. All right. Would that have been approximately correct April 25th, 2010 as well? It would be about 120, 140, anywhere in between. Okay. Drawing your attention to the date in question, April 25th, 2010, explain to the jury what if any communications you had or received from Sergeant Frank Turris uh, about individuals who had appeared on the, the grounds of the Cheshire County House Corrections, just describe that to them. Uh, include where you were and what the tourist, what the tourist's function was at the house that day. I was at home. Um, I was off duty. I received a phone call around 5:30. Um, he told me that there was a large number of protesters, um, to include even buses coming into the parking lot. Um, so that was my call with him. Yeah. Did he describe at all further what they were doing uh, on the House Corrections ground? Um, well, he said they were, you know, a large amount of them. They had signs. They were just around the building at this point in the parking lot. After receiving that call from Sergeant Taturis, what did you do? I called Superintendent Bale Buckley. And why did you do that? Because he's my command over me, he's a superintendent. All right. And what information did you give him and what decision did you reach together? I explained to him exactly what I had been told by Sergeant Taturis, that we had a large amount of protesters. They were outside the jail. Superintendent Bale Buckley advised me to let Sergeant Taurus know that he was to tell them to leave, and if they did not leave, then he was to call the King Police. And um, just briefly explain, why is it necessary to call the King Police in a situation like this? We felt that, for one, it can get the inmates inside a little bit more riled up. We didn't, it just didn't seem like a very safe situation. Um, and how did, how did the King Police assist you? in a situation like this? They would come up and you know, either make them leave or arrest them. Okay. How did you con convey your decision in consultation with the superintendent, who you describe as being the number one person at the House of Corrections, essentially? Yes. How did you convey that decision to order these people to leave to Sergeant DeTouris? I called back to the jail. I got Sergeant DeTouris on the phone. I explained to him that he needed to go out, tell everybody to leave, and that if they did not leave, then he was to call the campus. All right, and that, uh, because you're the major and he's the sergeant, that's essentially an order you're giving to him, telling him what to do. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. 
you did that by phone, you gave the tourists that order what to do. What did you do uh, after that? I then started to get ready and did respond to the jail. When you arrived at the jail, why don't you just explain briefly to the jury the situation. Where was it at at that point when you arrived? And, and how long was it before you got there? I got there, I believe it would have been about 6.15, 6.30. When I got there, there was nobody in the parking lot. I pulled up to the outside of our bay where the uh, law enforcement would enter and went in the side door there, inside. <laughs> when I went through there and then into the booking area, I saw a large amount of individuals. And I was told that they had been placed under arrest. Okay. What steps did you take, if any, to preserve a record of what happened that day, April 25th, 2010, at the House of Corrections? I was asked by Sergeant Samarellis to get all the cameras recorded, which they do, so I put everything on to the DVD. Explain for the jury who doesn't know, um, generally speaking, how are the cameras situated outside the House of Corrections? Uh, how does that system work? So there's quite a few cameras outside. There's one right in the parking lot, and it's called the Antil Zoo. It can move around to go to different areas in the parking lot. And then situated or on the building itself, around the whole perimeter, we have a number of cameras. And all of those are also Antil Zoo cameras that they can move around. You say the cameras can pan and move around. Who is controlling the cameras at any given time? There's two officers in control room, and they control those. Okay. You testified that you preserved some of the video of the events of that day, April 25th, 2010. Uh, just roughly, how many cameras did you uh, preserve? There's well, for this situation, I did. I believe it's seven. You've previously provided a copy of that video surveillance, is that right? Yes. And uh, what, if any, copy did you bring with you today? I do have a copy of that today. All right. May I approach the witness? You may. Okay, have this marked for identification as State's Exhibit 1. May I see that? It's being marked for identification, Mr. Johnson. You certainly have a chance to identify. In fact, if you want to talk, you're going to get it now. All right, uh, State's Exhibit 1 for identification is a disc that you just handed me. Uh, did you verify that this is, in fact, an accurate copy of the video surveillance April 25, 2010, that you had previously preserved? Yes. I'd ask that the ID be stricken on this exhibit. Any objection, Mr. Johnson? Yeah. Thank you so much. Major Musso, uh, place the uh, disc, States Exhibit 1, into a laptop here to project momentarily on the screen to your uh, left.
Well, do you recognize what has come up now on the screen as being the contents of that surveillance video which you previously preserved? Yes. Let me interrupt here for a minute. Mr. Johnson, if you can't see it, you can set up one of these chairs. <coughs> Approach your honor again.
Yeah. All right, Major. Uh, drawing your attention to the screen, you recognize this as being one of the camera views uh, at the Cheshire County House of Corrections, which you um, preserved on the date April 25, 2010. Yes, sir. And that motion there is the panning motion you were talking about. The person in the control room can move the camera around. Yes, sir. Is that right? All right. Now, down at the uh, bottom of the screen here, which I'm pointing to, there's the date, April 25, 2010. The time uh, appears to say something other than about 6 p.m. What, if any, explanation is there for the time being off? We moved into the jail on April 22nd. This was April 25th. We didn't realize that the times were off on all of the DVRs. When I checked and verified, there's about a seven hour difference. All right. But the date, April 25th, 2010, is accurate? Yes, sir. What are we looking at now uh, as the camera pans? What is that area with the cause? This is the front parking lot. All right. And that's where people who come to the House of Corrections park? Yes, sir. Fast forward a little bit. I pause it. There's a road in the back here, which my pointer doesn't. Think. There we go. This road back here. What is that? That is the entrance driveway into the facility. So if you go down that uh, down that road, so much to the point. Toward the right, that leads where? Leads out to the entrance to the Marlboro Road. Right, right down to the highway. Now is that the only way in up that road essentially, unless you're on foot? Yes. This video that you made, pretty long, hey? Yes. All right. I fast forwarded it now on four speed, four times regular speed, even more now. This shows the entire events of that day, is that correct? Yes, everything in the front section of the jail it shows. There's a gentleman uh, holding a large fake sword. I just want the uh, jury to take note of that, walking up the drive, of the road. And that's the road that you testified about being the entrance road. So did you, yes. Are you testifying that it's a fake sword? Uh, well, uh, Your Honor, I'm willing to strike the fake word. Uh, I'll sustain the objection. <laughs> What appears to be a sword, just please take note of that individual. <clears throat> you watched this entire video, is that right? No, sir, I have not. All right. <coughs> Verified that all the camera views that we're going to look at today are from that day, April 25, yes. 2010. Okay. The uh, the road that I was just on. <coughs> Paused it now. This is the uh, front. What, what what are we looking at right now? This is the front entrance to the jail. So that we're little foyer thing there is where they enter into the jail. I got a proposal screen. <coughs> you said little foyer. That little. There's a little triangular roof here. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. That is uh, where people can access 
the jail, whether they're coming uh, to visit or for any other reason, is that right? Yes, sir. All right. What we're watching now occurred prior to your arrival, is that correct? Yes, sir. Pause it again. There's a road that goes uh, straight ahead here. Where does that go? It goes around the outside of the jail, and we consider that the secure part of the facility. All right. So, so the road around does it wrap around the back side of the building? Yes, it does. It goes all the way around. It comes out of the other side. Of the side. Now, all that back area you consider the secure part of the building? Yes, sir. Again, I'm showing the, the film at four times speed. We're going to look at this again uh, later. People now are headed in what direction? As though they were either leaving us along the front side of the jail where the front end driveway is, the parking lot is. <coughs> some, some of these uh, people that we've been talking about are now appearing from that area that you consider the secure part of the facility? Yes, sir. Now, what, what security concerns do you have with people going on the back side of the House of Corrections? That's where our main housing units are for the male prisoners. All right. Um, getting them riled up would be bad for us. Would be bad for you in, in yes. what way? Um, it could cause us to have to go in there and you know, deal with them. And, it's a dangerous situation if they get upset. All right. Um, what ability does the population, the inmates in the facility have to see what's going on outside on that perimeter road that goes around the back of the... All of the, along the whole back part of the jail are windows up to the cells where the inmates live, so they can see everything going on. Again, I'm fast forwarding the tape. <clears throat> it appears in the video that uh, people are, are leaving, going down the drive, is that correct? Yes, sir. And once again, this is that same road you were testifying about. This road is the way to get out of the facility, the only way in a car, right? Yes. All right. You still have not arrived at this point in the video, is that correct? Yes, sir.
that sign that we're looking at is this one of the many no trespassing signs that are on the property? Yes, it is. We've got a group of people coming back up the road, is that right? Yes. Among them, the gentleman I mentioned earlier holding what looks like a large sword and shield. that they're headed? That goes around the side of the jail. That is that access road that goes around the whole jail. And that, again, is the area that uh, you said we can you consider uh, secure? Yes, sir. <coughs> back there some people appearing in the back. And these right here, you see those? Yes, sir. So they're coming from that area that you described as uh, having windows in the, in the, the inmates can look out of that yes. cause you concerns. They have people milling around out there. Is that right? Yes.
I'm just going to let that play a little bit. You still have not arrived, is that right? That is correct. And there's the gentleman with the sword there. Do you have, did you preserve views uh, for the back side of the building? Yes, I did. All right. So when these folks go out of sight, you were able to capture what was going on out of sight, is that right? So you need to be seated. Thank you. into uh, a different camera's view. I want you just to describe where the camera is in relation to that perimeter road that we were talking about. This is on the, as you come in, you go to the right of the jail and start going down. This is that perimeter road, and in the background you can see group one. All right, so that is that would be what the north side of the jail essentially. Not that it matters. Yeah. So if you don't, I don't worry about it. But that's uh, Route 101, which is also Mar Marlboro Road. Is that right? Yes. All right. This whole area is where the windows are. Yes. As well, right where they are now is where there's female prisoners, and the windows are. And as they come down further, past those yellow barriers then there'll be windows where the nails are. showing the mail blocks yes and you can just see the windows in the building that I will attempt to point out what are these things right here yes those are the windows to the mail. all right There are some people going to the right on the screen. Where are, where are they headed? What's in that, that area? If there, is, site. there is a door into the jail in there. Down through that little alley. That pan and view that we just looked at, that also shows windows into the inmate area? Yes. <coughs> now, the gentleman with the sword and the shield just came out of that area you were describing an alcove with a door into the yes, facility? Yes, sir. Also windows in that area? Or? Yes, there's windows. Mm -hmm. Should be the segregation in there, it's a good seat. <coughs> Know, while we watch, what is the segregation unit? That's um, 
where we keep our inmates that have acted out inside the jail, the ones that are the most unruly. Um, so they're basically, in other words, the solitary confinement. Awesome. So, so the, there's even heightened security yes, concern? That, that would be our highest classification. Is there another camera view around the back of the jail? Yes, sir, there is. here does not show actually the back right that's, that's where's that the front um, right as you come entering going to the right and then around the jail okay also along that same road you can see it's right on the corner of the back of the jail and you can see that road as they come along the inside and it goes all the way around and covers the back of the jail so this all across the screen here this road here is the perimeter road yes it goes around the house yes of corrections and they're actually inside the perimeter road at this point is that right yes sir okay There, this gentleman here is walking towards something. What, what is uh, he headed toward? That is a door on the back of the jail. Okay. Mr. Johnson, you need to stand and address me as to what the objection is. She'll be approaching. I can approach, sure.
This whole group passing by the windows you described? Yes, they are. And this is what? This is also the back. It's just showing it from the other side. So it's on the opposite corner. All right, so it's the same thing we've been watching. One, one of these people pulls on the back door. Right.
gentlemen, in an attempt uh, to move this case along, I want to show you enjoying the video. Uh, the parties have agreed and stipulated that Mr. Johnson uh, was present at the Cheshire County House of Corrections on April 25th of, this, of last year, and that the only issue uh, that will be presented to you for your consideration is whether Mr. Johnson was given adequate notice uh, to the park and whether a reasonable person would have taken it as such. Uh, which I think Mr. Johnson reflected in his opening statement that the issue that he, as he saw it was uh, that he was not personally advised to leave. So uh, he has stipulated that he was there uh, and we will proceed, the state will now proceed and present the evidence as to what notice was provided to uh, Mr. Johnson and anybody else there uh, as to the appropriateness of the presence and whether they needed to leave. Does that accurately set forth our discussion with Mr. Butler? Yes, Your Honor, with the addition that uh, the defendant is in, has indicated that he also stipulates he's the person with the large story. Yeah, does that accurately reflect our discussion, Mr. Johnson? It does. Thank you. Mr. Johnson, please state your name. Mr. Webb, if you need a recess at this point to, to, to uh, proceed in a more expeditious fashion, you can take it. Uh, I think the timing would be good for that. Please. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll take a brief recess. Uh, as I caution you at the outset of this trial, please don't discuss the case among yourselves. And we will so such time as the evidence has been completed. Uh, we will work diligently in your absence to try to streamline this case for you. Um, and we'll be back with you shortly. Thank you. All right.
guys as plans for most of the show and stuff like that. Just get rid of that maybe less than a month. Few minutes longer because they reach the verdict. Oh, yeah. that's right. That's everything. Excuse me, I suggest it's going to be a few more minutes because they reach the verdict. You know, the final review will be here. Here So it will be here. We're making a deep deal at 1050.
Jerry, you're on. Thank you. Please be seated. Our apologies, ladies and gentlemen, for the length of the uh, recess I had to deal with the other jury, which I mentioned to you. So there might be a possibility earlier. Uh, the case has now been resolved. There be no further interruptions, but my apologies. Mr. Lerner. Thank you, Your Honor. Major Musso, I remind you that you remain under oath. May I approach the witness? Yeah, may. So I'm showing you what's marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit 2. Do you recognize what that is? Yes, this is the sign. Go around with you. Okay, and uh, that was the sign as it appeared April 25th, 2010? Yes. And now I'm showing you State's Exhibit 3 for identification purposes. Same photo, just a, a little bit enlarged. Is that right? Yes. All right. Are these accurate photographs of the no trespassing signs as they appeared on the date in question, April 25th, 2010? Yes, they are. Now, uh, I've got a stack of copies here. Are these copies all uh, fair and accurate copies of State's Exhibit 3? Yes. For identification. You said, again, these are uh, reasonably accurate photographs of the sign as it appeared, right? Yes. Move to strike the ID on these two exhibits. Objection, Mr. Yeah. And request to publish uh, the copies of State's Exhibit 3 to the jury. You can do so, although, ladies and gentlemen, I will advise you that the exhibits will be with you in the jury deliberation room, so it's more important to pay attention to the testimony in the court than the exhibits. Thank you. States Exhibits 2 and 3 appears on the road leading into the facility, is that right? Yes. And how many signs are there on that road as you enter the facility? There's four. All right, four of this sign were posted on April 25, 2010 on the road. Yes. And uh, permission to approach again? Granted. you what's marked as State's Exhibit 4 for identification purposes. Do you recognize what that is? Yes, I do. What is it? It's an outline of the jail. All right. And uh, essentially shows a schematic of the jail and the different blocks. Is that right? Yes. And that's an aerial view, is it? Yes. Now there are some... Um, is, this, is this a reasonably fair and accurate depiction of the aerial view of the House of Corrections? as it was April 25th, 2010. Yes. Permission to strike the ID on this exhibit. Keep it. Any objection? No. Maybe, maybe no. And I have in my hand a stack of copies. Are they uh, fair and accurate copies of State's Exhibit 4? Yes. Permission to publish these to the jury. Right. Let's look at states four for a moment. Um,
All right, the, the uh, Stacey Exhibit 4 is, the, you said, an aerial view of the whole house of directions. <coughs> there are black dots around um, the perimeter of the schematic, and it appears there are how many? There's seven. And what do those black dots represent? That's where the signs are. All right. These, these signs are. So the signs depicted in States 2 and 3 uh, it's the same sign. Those were all posted in those seven locations? Yes, sir. And that's in addition to the four on the road? Correct. Okay. And then there's, it says on the chart here, one going? There is one on the gate that goes up the access road to the water tower. All right, so we got 12 signs on the property in total? Yes. All right. Now, on um, State's Exhibit 4, you'll note there's a V that says lobby visitation. Um, is that the side of the building where the flagpoles are? Yes. That's the entryway we were talking about in the video. Correct. Opposite side, uh, on, the, on the side where block D, M, S, etc. are, that's the side where Route 101 and Marlboro Road are? Yes. Oh. Okay. Now we watched in the video as uh, two times as the defendant walked on the end of the House of Corrections down uh, where D and K are located in States 4 on the dirt. Was that inside the, the perimeter of the signs? When he walked on the end of the building, was it inside the perimeter of the sign? Yes. All right. And what about when it appeared from the um, video that he went in, into one of those side alcoves? Is that also past the sign? Yes, it is. All right. All right, thank you very much. I have nothing further. You may go Major Musong? Uh, you said you were head of security at the, the uh, House of Corrections? I'm the director of safety and security. Director of safety and security. Is your building secure? I hope so. My building's secure. It needs to be the inside. If someone were to walk up to the uh, any of the doors <coughs> on the outside of the building and tug on them when they open, Shouldn't. They should. They should not. They should be Is there open. a reason they would would open? If somebody mistakenly hit a door, unlocked it, or something. They're all controlled by the cameras. <laughs> Mr. Johnson, I, I don't know what the relevancy of this line of questioning is. Um, it was shown in the video that it's, uh, since it was presented to the jury that somebody tucked on the door. I'm just wondering how how unsafe that was. Well, I think that you and the state have agreed that the issue is whether you were. Properly advised of your right not to be there. So whether the facility is secure or not is irrelevant for purposes of this case. Very good. That's what I want. Uh, at what point did you personally tell me to leave the property? I never told you personally to leave the property. And one other thing that is in that is addressed here is. Uh, how many people ask you permission to come onto the property? Nobody asks permission to come on the property. They're allowed to come there if they're there to visit or for a purpose. So if I read this correctly, that uh, A person is guilty of criminal trespass if knowing that he is not licensed or privileged to do so. Uh, do you ever license anybody to be on the property? I don't understand what that would mean. So, you would say there was no licensing involved. You have no knowledge of such things. Yeah. Okay. 
And would you say when a person walks up the driveway, they're privileged to be on the property? As long as they're there for a purpose, a lawful purpose, yes. And you stay fully in with your full knowledge that you did not personally advise me to be to get off the property? Absolutely not. I did not advise you. No further questions. Uh, just, just one. Uh, the privilege ceases when someone's uh, ordered to leave the property. Is that right? Yes. Thank you. Nothing further. Here, you missed up there. Witnesses excuse them. Uh, the state is not required present day. Witnesses excuse Mr. Yes. <coughs> state calls Frank the tourist. Step to the front, please, and remain standing. Please raise your right hand. You swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the penalties and pains of perjury. I do. Have a seat, please. And I'd like you to state your name and spell your last name for the record. My name is Frank DeTorres, D E capital T U R R I S. And tell the jury, please, what your current occupation is. I'm an assistant shift supervisor at the Cheshire County House of Corrections. And how long have you worked at the Cheshire County House of Corrections? Shortly under five years. Okay. What does, uh, briefly, what does an assistant shift supervisor do? I supervise in the absence of the shift commander and basically in charge of one of the floor officers on the floor when he's there, too. Okay. I want to draw your attention to a particular date, April 25th, 2010, shortly before 6 p.m. Were you on duty at the Cheshire County House of Corrections on that day? Yes, I was. What were your responsibilities on that day? I was the shift supervisor that day. Okay, so that day you were the shift supervisor? Yes. In charge of the, the whole shift? Well, the, yeah, the whole jail, the shift. Okay. What, if anything, unusual came to your attention on that day, April 25th, 2007, uh, about that time, shortly before 6 p.m.? I was told by the Central Control that there was a large group of people gathering out in the parking lot. Okay. And Central Control is, is that uh, location where the people monitor the cameras, is that right? Yes, sir. I think. Uh, when you learned about this information, Specifically, what were you told by Central Control was happening outside? There was a large group of people gathering outside with some signs. Okay. And what did you do when you learned that information? I went to look for myself out the back door. And they weren't down this way yet. Towards oh. the young front door, they were still out in the general parking lot. All right. So you said they weren't down this way, and you gestured to it yourself. They weren't at the entrance door to the visitor entrance? Yes. That's what I was trying to refer to, yes. Okay. You saw for yourself what was going on, uh, and what did you do after you saw what was happening? I got a call from Agent Musa. Okay, and why did you call him? Because he's directly in charge of safety and security with him. All right. You had a conversation with him uh, about what was happening there at the jail? Yes. What happened next? He was going to call Superintendent Van Winkler to get back to me on what to do. Okay, and did he get back to you? Yes, he did. What did he instruct you to do? Ask him to leave. They don't leave. Call the police. Musso told you, ask them to leave. If they don't leave, call the police. Yes. Okay. You got that order from Musso. What did you do? Went outside and asked the group to leave. All right. Where did this take place? You went outside and you said you asked the group to leave. Where were you when you did that? In between the, um, I don't know if you have a picture of the entrance. I was in between the sidewalk and the flagpole. Okay, so you were in the area of the flagpole? Yes. Who was with you? Officer Coyle and Sergeant Fallon. So three officers, 
while you were giving these instructions? Need to verbally respond, sir. Oh yes, sir. Sorry. All right. Now I want you to tell the jury. We're going to look at a picture in a minute, but I want you to tell the jury uh, what you told this group of people. Go ahead. General, you guys all you all can't leave. You can't be out here gathering. It's private property all the time. You can't be out here. If you don't leave, I'm going to call the king police. All right. And how uh, when you gave these instructions, how loud were you being? Loud enough that people who heard me did leave, so people in the back left. Okay, so even the people in the back left? What response did you get the was me? It, was there a verbal answer to that question? Nope. Mm -hmm. From, oh yes, those people in the back heard me, yes. Alright. <coughs> what was it about their actions that made you believe that they heard you? They thought leaving. Okay. Um, how many times did you tell them this? Two or three times. Okay. Do you uh, see in the courtroom today one of the individuals that was uh, in that crowd that you were addressing by the flag? Yes, I do. And could you point him off the jury? And the record reflect the witness identified the defendant, Mr. Johnson. The record will so reflect. Draw your attention to the screen. You see a picture of the Cheshire County House of Corrections. And you can see in that picture the flags. Is that right? Yes. Here are the flags, correct? Is this the area you're talking about where you were when you addressed the crowd? Yes. I'm going to fast forward. This is the crowd you were talking about that you saw gathering in the parking lot, is that right? Yes. People coming from various directions, correct? Yes. The defendant, however, came up the road, right? Yes. Coming out of the entrance are two individuals. Who are they? I'm going to point to them on the screen. These two right here, who are they? The one in the front is myself, and the one to the right in this area is um, Officer Coyle. All right, so you're, I'm pointing to you right now? Yes. And behind you is Coyle? Yes. Now, are you beginning to address the crowd here? <coughs> I believe so, yes. Well, I did a moment ago, I'm not closer. Right about there. <coughs> There's a third person that's just come out. Who's that? That's Sergeant Fallon. Okay. Now, you said you did this two or three times. You told these people they have to leave or you're going to call the police, right? Yes. And that is occurring in this time frame. Is that right? Yes. And the defendant with the sword is here, correct? Yes.
Any doubt in your mind that you were loud enough to make all these people hear you? There's no doubt in what they all heard. Okay. Well, they heard me because someone started walking away. Mr. Johnson, if, if you have an objection, you need to stand and address me, and then I will consider it. You can't talk to the witness in that fashion. I will want to address it on cross. The group, I'm fast forwarding at high speed. Evidently, in response to you telling them they had to go, starts to head toward the parking lot, right? Yes. Okay. That's an assumption. It's objection. That's an assumption on his part as to why the crowd is moving. Yep. Um, I, I asked what the appearance was. It's certainly a fair uh, assessment. I'm going to rip over the objections to this. All that we're seeing now happened after you addressed the crowd and told them to leave. Is that correct? Yes. It certainly appears that most of the people are leaving, correct? Yes. Is that keen to you? Yes, sir. All right, we're still fast forwarding. And here comes back a group of the same people you just told to leave. Is that right? Yes. Including the defendant with his sword? Yes. However, instead of leaving, they're going around the building. And one more time. Is that right? Yes. Including the defendant? Yes. I object. There's no evidence of how many times this, this group went around the building. All right. I think the video speaks for itself. Uh, the jury can conclude. Since the timestamp on the video is wrong, there, there is no presentation as to how many times uh, any one group has gone around the building. I can rephrase the question. Let me withdraw the question. Rephrase it after you instructed the group to leave, the group which included the defendant. The defendant, with some others, came back and went around the House of Corrections, correct? Yes. Here they come back 
from the back side, right? Yes. Defendant among them? Yes. Shortly after that, the decision was made to arrest them because they did not follow your instructions, right? Yes. Some of them were actually still let, allowed to leave, but those who hung around still in the parking lot were the ones who got arrested. Is that right? Yes. Okay, thank you. You may inquire. Thank you. Sergeant Deterris, um, you were asked if you thought everybody heard you in the crowd. How did you answer? I said, well, uh, yeah, I said yes, then, well. What was the wow about? Most people heard me because there was other people chanting on me, why must we leave? People had to hear me because some of the people in the back left. You, so you just assumed that they heard you because they turned around and were doing something else? I don't assume they heard me because they, they started leaving. Can we have uh, our 10 uh, minute point on, please? Uh, how many people were arrested that day for this incident? Twelve, I believe. How many went to trials? Objection, Your Honor. Not Sus relevant. Sustained. Of your personal uh, experience, how many trials did you testify in? Ob objection. It's not relevant. Wish to approach, Mr. Jones? Yes. Tell me to leave the property. I personally told the group, and you were on the group. So you, your testimony is that you did not personally talk to me at any point, correct? Right? No, personally, do you want to want to know? Objection to your approach. Thank you. 
Sergeant Deterris, uh, at any time did the, you and I talk one-on-one? -on -one? No. in the uh, the group uh, had their attention on you or were people talking or communicating amongst themselves did everybody have you, their your rap attention I couldn't answer that so, what was your observations of the group besides somebody in back turned around and did something else because most of you most of them started leaving Did they tell you they were leaving, or did they just walk in another direction? They walked in another direction. All right. Good. Want to play? Just a few frames. Just until I get to 25. certain that everybody was uh, looking at you, correct? Most people were looking in my direction, yes. But I don't know if everybody was. Uh, Did anybody respond to your... Uh, so you can take the stand again. Are you, are you through with, it, with the screen, uh, Mr. Johnson? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, there's no one there. Did anybody respond to uh, you? Yes, we're leaving. <laughs> Some people responded and asked me why they had to leave and just some other comments. So there was a couple of people who heard you. Yeah. I'm so, yes. Okay. Would you uh, repeat for us uh, your command that you issued that day in the, uh, in the voice that you used? I'll try to do the voice I use. <laughs> you gentlemen, must, everybody must leave. You guys can't be doing what we're doing out here. It's hard to If you guys don't leave, I want to call the police. That might uh, not be the exact tone. Okay. That, that was the volume? No, it might not be. I don't remember how loud it exactly is. So, outdoors, 30 to 40 feet away with people interposed, do you expect the people to hear you and understand you? Yes. Is it possible that some people didn't hear you? Sure it is. Uh, just a couple. You, you said some in the group yelled back at you. Yes. 
responded, why do we have to leave? Yes. Okay. And it was your sense that the crowd, in, the crowd heard you and responded to you in your command to leave? Yes. Okay. Thank you. No In your opinion, is the crowd one entity? If you spoke in one, to one part of the crowd, the uh, all of the crowd would understand you? No. Thank you. Can we step down? State calls Arthur Coyle. Can we check with John? Can we see something? Okay. John. John, can, can he be released? John, can he be released? As far as I'm concerned, Nate, the witness be released? Yes. yes. Can get you. State your full name and spell your last name for record. Arthur Coyle, C-O-Y-L-E. Tell these uh, folks here, where do you work? <coughs> At uh, Cheshire Department of Corrections in Keene. All right, and where specifically do you actually work? What location? 825 Marlboro Road, Keene, New Hampshire. All right, is that the House of Corrections? Yes. Sir. All right. What is your uh, title? Uh, corrections officer. And how long have you been there? About a year. Okay. April 25th, 2010, were you working there? Yes. Drawing your attention to about 6 p.m., a little before 6 p.m., April 25th, 2010. Um, what, if anything, do you recall assisting officer, excuse me, Sergeant Deterris to do on that particular day? Yes, I assisted him. And, and what was it that you helped him with? Uh, I went outside and told the uh, three stairs that they had to leave. Okay. Uh, Council first.
If during the course of this case any other matters come to you to, to you individually, that's the reason you can't serve as a friend of Arthur Jura, please bring it to my attention. Thank you. Those two people who are on the sidewalk, right here. Who is that? The taller one is me, and the shorter one is Sergeant Gutierrez. Okay, and uh, we called it a crowd. This group here is the people that you were talking about <coughs> that Gutierrez spoke to, right? Yes. All right. And it was during this time, as we're watching it unfold, that the tourist was addressing the crowd. Is that right? I believe so. There's a third officer there with you. Who was that? Sergeant Fallon. Now, he's already addressed the crowd at that point, is that correct? Yes. All right. Now, uh, uh, among that group, by the way, we got one, one fella today uh, among that group in the courtroom. Yes, sir. Who? Mr. James Johnson. All right. I want you to tell the jury, uh, <coughs> while you were outside with the tourists and he addressed the crowd, describe for the jury how loud was the tourist when he addressed that crowd? Uh, he, he pretty much yelled, he notified all of them that the police were coming and to leave the premises. Um, he said it pretty loud and most of them all left. There was a few that didn't leave, which that's the result of it. Thank you. Okay. How many times did he tell them? It was, I don't know exactly, but it was multiple times. It was right. at least twice. All right, so but it was more than once. Yes. In a loud voice. Yes. And what was your impression about whether this group could hear him? You were there. What was your impression about whether they could hear him? I got the impression that they heard him. Okay. <coughs> After this, they, they mingle out, but some of them come back. Is that right? Yes. And this group that came back goes around the house of directions. Is that right? Yes. And it was uh, from that group that the arrests were made. Is that right? Yes, sir and the defendant was one of those people. Yes, sir. All right. And you assisted in that process, um, the, uh, the process of arresting the people. You assisted Keen PD. Is that, is that correct? I did. All right. Um, they were all issued hand summons and allowed to leave. Is that right? Yes, sir.
So you don't know why we were arrested. I do. Why were we arrested? Criminal trespass. about private property? Was this, was this subsequent to your arrest, Mr. Johnson? And, and, if, and if so, is, is it relevant? Uh, uh, I believe the, uh, the uh, military people were, uh, were under the impression that this was private property and were acting under, under uh, something along that border instead of this being public land. I'm not sure if you can present that argument in your case, but for purposes of <coughs> cross-examining this witness, I'm not sure. Conversations you engage in after the arrest of him. Yes, witness can be released, Mr. Jones? Yes. State your full name and spell your last name, please. Sandra K. Fallon, F is in Frank, A L L O N. All right, uh, where are you employed? Chish County Department of Corrections. And where do you where do you go to work? Where do you actually work every day? 825 Malvern Street at the county jail. Okay, at the, at the House of Corrections. How long have you been employed there? Almost 10 years, 10 years in August. And what, do uh, you have a rank? Um, Sergeant First Class. Okay. I want to draw your attention to the date that we're talking about, April 25th, 2010, around 6 p.m. Um, were you involved in assisting or were you present with off, uh, Sergeant DeTouris when he addressed a group of people outside the House of Corrections on that day? Yes, I was. All right. Who was it that was out there? Uh, I mean, for office. It was myself, Officer Torres, Officer Coyle. Okay. I want to draw your attention to the screen here. You notice, uh, you recognize what that is a picture of? It's a picture of the jail. All right. I'm going to run it forward a little bit. Do you recognize this as the events of April 25th, 2010? Yes. There are two, two officers standing just off the sidewalk. Who are they? Frank Torres and <coughs> And now here comes another individual walking out onto the sidewalk. Who is that? That's myself. All right. This is the time period where uh, the tourists address this crowd of people, is that right? Yes. Now, I want you to explain to the jury, and now he's walking back after he's addressed the crowd, is that right? Yes. All right. Tell the jury uh, 
how loud was Sergeant Deterris being when he addressed this crowd of people and told them to leave? He was loud. Okay. And to the best that you can remember, it doesn't have to be a direct quote, but what did he tell them? Um, asking you to leave um, and that he would call the police if they did not leave. Okay. And how many times did he say it? Um, I, w I would say three. Might have only been two, but at okay. least two that I clearly heard him okay. address them to leave. And I believe the third time he told them, I will call the police. All right. And what was your impression of uh, the crowd's ability to hear Sergeant Deterris' instructions to leave? I believe they heard him clearly because some left, some stayed. Okay. And they were hollering for the others to come back and yeah, back, don't leave. So. All right. So the crowd actually responded to Deterris' instructions to leave? Some did, yes. Okay. And how loud would they be after, after he gave the instructions? And these responses started coming. How loud were the responses? From them? Yeah. They were loud. Okay. All right. And it was after this point that uh, most of them left, but then another group came up, defended among them, and went around the House of Corrections. And then they were arrested by King P, right? Okay, thank you. Give me a quarter. At any point, did we have a one-on-one -on -one conversation? Myself and you? No, we did not. Did you see me respond to uh, Sergeant DeTurris's uh, utterances? No, I did not. You, you did not respond. So you can't be sure that I heard? I cannot. But the tourist was uh, communicating with this crowd loudly, is that right? Yes. And your impression was the people in the crowd heard him? Yes. You don't know whether someone might be deaf or not, but you had the impression that they heard you? Correct. He was loud enough so it was heard quite a distance. People that were well behind him were leaving and running. And yes. All right, so people behind the defendant responded to the instructions? Yes. All right, thank you very much. Nothing further. Can she be released, please? Yeah. Right, Mr. Police, Mr. Yes. All right. State calls James Samarella. about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the penalties and pains of perjury. Thank you. you have a seat. Tell the jury, please, your uh, name and also spell your last name if you would. Uh, my name is James Samarellis. The last name is spelled C-E-M-O-R-E-L-I-S. And what's your current occupation? Uh, I'm a sergeant with the City of Keene Police Department. And how long have you worked for the Keene Police Department? Uh, about 14 years. What are your uh, general duties? What's your rank in your general duties? Uh, at the time, uh, at this time, I'm assigned to the uh, prosecutor's office, and uh, I'm in the rank of sergeant. And as of April 25th, 2010, what were your duties then? At that time, I was the uh, I was the uh, day shift uh, shift supervisor, sorry, the shift sergeant uh, for day shift. Okay. I want to draw your attention to that date, April 25th, 2010. At approximately 6 p.m., you were on duty at that time? I was. And what, if any, call to, did you get at that time on that date in reference to the House of Corrections, the Cheshire County House of Corrections? Uh, on that date, I was the uh, I was the shift commander, which meant that I was 
responsible for the overall police activities going on, with, specifically with the Keene Police Department within the city. Um, I received a call uh, from our dispatcher who uh, informed me that they had received a call from the Cheshire County House of Corrections that there were uh, a number of protesters that were up at the facility, uh, that they had been asked to leave, and that they were refusing to leave. All right, so when you got the call, uh, the indication was they had been asked to leave but, but refused. How did you respond to that? Uh, well, I I drove up uh, I drove to the facility to uh, kind of get a, a personal perspective on on what was going on and to meet with the uh, and to meet with the uh, the jail personnel that were up there dealing with the situation. All right, I want you to describe for the jury briefly when you arrived at 825 Marlboro Road. Just as you drove in, you know, what did you see until you actually parked your vehicle? Uh, the uh, the jail the facility that is the new facility that's right off of Route 101. So as I approached from 101, I noticed that there were a number of uh, a number of vehicles that were parked along uh, the side of the uh, roadway uh, around the entranceway to the jail facility. Um, I noted that there were a number of people that were that were walking along the highway looked like they were either walking uh, away from the jail to, to walk away or walking towards different vehicles to, to leave. Um, as I turned into the jail facility, I noticed that there were a number of people that were uh, coming down the uh, roadway from the jail towards 101 uh, as if they were leaving the property. Um, as I continued to approach the actual building itself, I noticed that there was a smaller group uh, that was actually heading up the roadway towards the building. Um, I passed this group and continued on up to the building. When I got up there, I noticed that there was, uh, there were no protesters up there. There were no people in the parking lot. Um, and I drove around to the main entrance of the facility where I met with uh, Sergeant Contreras, who I believe was running the shift there at the jail at the time, or at least one of the supervisors involved with the <coughs> at the jail. Okay. You had a conversation with Sergeant Contreras? I did. And could you tell the jury um, what it was that he briefed you on at that point, what he told you? Uh, he told me that uh, shortly prior to my arrival, there were... Uh, I think between like 40 and 50, he said, uh, people that were up at the, up at the jail facility, um, that, they, that they were all congregating in front of the front door, uh, protesting, that uh, he had informed them to leave, and that initially they had not, uh, they had not complied with that order. That's good. Uh, Mr. Brooks? <coughs> You received a briefing from uh, Sergeant Deterris. I want to draw your attention to the screen over here to my right, your left. And I'm going to fast forward it just so we have a sense. You let us know when you arrive, when you see uh, yourself arrive, if you would. I'm going to go fast.
approach. You arrive after the tourists address the crowd, right? Yes. And um, after receiving information from him about his address of the crowd, you saw a group come back and go around the house of corrections. Is that right? Correct. While I was while I was present at the GLF. Right. At some point here, you arrive, you get the briefing from the tourists, right? After that, after he tells you what he did with that crowd, this group comes up, disappears around the back of the house correction, is that right? Yes. And then comes back around to the flagpole area, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Some of those people were even then allowed to leave, right? Yes. But there was a, a small group that stayed behind and did not leave even at that point, right? Yes. Among them was... Among that smaller group that did not leave, is there a person in the courtroom today present? Uh, the defendant here, Mr. James Johnson. All right. May the record reflect the witness that identified the defendant? The record will do so. And he was among that small group who did not leave, <coughs> who was arrested for criminal trespass? Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. Nothing further. Thank you. Mr. Johnson. Sir, Mr. Um, did we have uh, any one-on-one -on -one conversation prior to the arrest? No. How do you know that uh, an order was, or a request was given to leave the property? I was told by Sergeant Terrace that you were going to ask to leave the property. So you just accepted his word on that? Yes, I did. You didn't investigate his, or challenge his word whatsoever? I took his, I took his probable cause at its face value. Why? He told, he told me that he ordered you folks to leave, and I acted on that. Why did you just accept them? Would, if uh, if an owner had uh, of a property had come up to you and I said I told these people to leave my property, uh, would you just accept that and arrest the person on the spot? There may be times when that happens. Yes. Why didn't you investigate his claim? The investigation. I did investigate the claim. Um, I investigated it by speaking with him 
he was the supervisor that was in charge of the facility. He told me that he had ordered you all to leave and I acted on that. that Wouldn't you say that uh, his answers would be prejudicial? He would be uh, the one saying that he had asked people to leave. Why didn't you ask any of the other people, the, the people that were arrested, if, he had, if they were asked to leave? There was no need to ask at that no point. No need? There was no need to ask at that point. Uh, I was told that, that you folks were asked to leave, that you had refused. Uh, it's, not my, it's not my purpose to ask you guys to continue to leave. It's my, it was my purpose at that point to enforce the law, and that was to affect the arrest for the criminal trespass. Really? So back to my original question, would uh, if somebody off the, the street or maybe a landowner had said that I told these people to get off the, my property, would you just go out and arrest them? And I guess I'll refer to my same answer as that there very well may be certain circumstances where, um, where that would happen, yes. So you would investigate in some circumstances? No. What I mean was, is that if under the example that you gave me, you asked if I would go and just make an immediate arrest, and there may be times when that happens, yes. Could you describe any of those circumstances? Uh, I know that in this particular circumstance, um, I didn't feel that, uh, that investigation beyond what I did was was warranted that I had probable cause to believe that the people who were arrested in that incident were, uh, were, were that, there, that it was time to uh, arrest them. I had probable cause to make the arrest of that. Isn't it true that you were assuming that a, a police officer would not lie to you and that you had no reason to investigate? I am. I allow, allows me to uh, use discretion, and I, I took the uh, information that I got from Sergeant Curtis at its face value. So the uh, you had the discretion whether to ask people or not, whether uh, any questions at all to investigate, but you chose to arrest these people. Why? Well, I think that's been asked and answered, hasn't it? Um, uh, all right. Do you have any prejudice against the free state project? No. To uh, just arrest these people? Um, I'm not satisfied with the answer. Well, I mean, it, I think if you look at the whole, the, the totality of the circumstance uh, and what was actually going on there, and uh, right. what was going on there? Well, there are a number of people that were there that were uh, that were not there for what the jail considered to be a legitimate purpose. Um, that they were not that, that the group went beyond uh, an area where um, a reasonable person would expect that they were allowed to go. I mean, you know, a reasonable police officer. I think a reasonable person. Mr. Johnson, you, you can't argue with a witness. You can ask okay. a question. And you can let him answer the question if, it, if he hasn't finished it. You can't argue. I think, I think a reasonable person showing up to a secure, secure government facility like a jail wouldn't wouldn't assume that they could just walk around the entire facility when certain areas such as the main entranceway and parking lots um, are right are, are available. I think most people would assume that if they were there for a legitimate purpose, such as visiting or making deliveries or something like that, that they would assume that they would go to the established parking lot and then the established entrance to the jail and not walk all around the entire facility. So it's your testimony that, uh, that you did not personally communicate before the arrest and that you had no direct knowledge of, the, uh, of uh, Sergeant Deturis talking to the crowd. Well, my communication was when I announced the arrest. And, and so so you, I, I did not, I did not, I did not personally order you to leave. Well, it's not, was, it, it's not my position to do that. That's not my, where I have my authority. No further questions.
Uh, you did corroborate subsequently uh, the, by gathering statements and by viewing all the video, did you not? I did, yes. So you did uh, further the investigation to make sure what you were told was accurate, right? Post arrest, yes. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Can you just Mr. Webb, you both Should we? Can you just Can you just Can you just Can you Can you just Can you Gentlemen, uh, we're going to recess for the lunch. For lunch. Uh, my information is to make it uh, a short lunch. Uh, it has been provided for you downstairs. Which is why I don't think you need more time than maybe half an hour. That's agreeable with you. Uh, so, as I have cautioned you earlier, please don't discuss the case among yourselves or with any just with anybody who wants to do this yourself. So. Uh, please don't discuss the case. Uh, and I ask that you be ready for that for 1.15. If that doesn't provide you adequate time, depending on what we're serving you, which I assume is that you will certainly have adequate time, uh, let us know when we will delay the start. But otherwise, we'll see you at 1.15. Thank you. Can I ask you if uh, people have the right to peacefully assemble and protest on public property? Uh, you cannot ask me questions, but thank I you. I can't? No. Is the public official that knows the law? Gathering you have been to like this one? No. Uh, 
where have other gatherings been? At the uh, Cheshire County House of Corrections located in West Moline. West Moline? Yep. When, uh, how many times uh, would you say you've been out to gatherings outside that correctional facility? I believe three times, at least two. At uh, any of those gatherings, did any police officer, security officer, any member of the jail speak to you about being there? No. Not once? No. Uh, times of day? Do you recall anything about the times of day that you were out around the, the correctional facility? Uh, I do not recall the exact time. It was during daylight hours. Were you aware? So this, uh, this picture <laughs> properly represents what's, uh, what was going on that day? Yes. And you're familiar with this scene? Yes. And you're not certain that you were in this crowd at all? This is the same scene that was shown at my trial, and I was pointed out in the crowd. <clears throat> so, in this scene? Yes, in this scene. Okay. So when you were here, did you hear Sergeant Deterris tell people to leave? No, I did not. <clears throat> Having been at previous gatherings, uh, would you have expected them to tell you to leave at this gathering? No. There was no reason to believe that they would treat you any different at this facility than they did at the last facility? I did not expect anything different. <clears throat> Uh, sure. Um, start with the last question. No reason to, to treat you differently here at this facility than at Westmoreland. Uh, this facility actually has 12 signs that clearly state uh, that you cannot that all visitors must check in, right? There was no evidence provided that visitors had to check in. It's on one of the exhibits that's in the sign. You may proceed. So, contrary to Westmoreland, all visitors have to check in. <coughs> I was not aware that all visitors had to check in. That, no. There were um, by crap you right. <laughs> How about that? Um, strike the all visitors have to check in. All right. But contrary to the Westmoreland facility, there were twelve signs posted on this property, many of which you had to pass <coughs> to get up to the building, correct? And these signs warned that this is a secure government facility, right? Correct. 
I'm going to hold this down just so I don't make a mistake again. This is a secure government facility. Trespassers are subject to arrest and prosecution. Yes? Yes. And defiance of any order to leave is a misdemeanor. Okay. Twelve of those signs around this place, which is much different from Westmoreland, right? I did not recall any signs of Westmoreland, correct. So there's the difference. This sign has a big warning, no trespassing on it, right? Correct. All right. Defying in order to leave. I understand. Thank you. Now, uh, you were in this crowd, you said, but you're not sure where, right? Correct. You don't from know that, what... From that image, it's blurry, and I'm not sure. I know I was wearing a green shirt. Okay. You, uh, you certainly heard Sergeant Deterris addressing the crowd. I did not. You, you didn't even hear any anything? I did not. You saw the three officers. Let's start with that. Yes? I saw them standing out there, yes. But you didn't hear a peep from them? I did not. You heard the people in your crowd yell back responses to something. I understand you say you didn't hear the sort of say anything, but people started yelling back about why do we have to leave, things of that nature, right? I did not hear that. So you didn't hear any responses either? No. You were not standing with the defendant in this group, right? I do not believe that I was standing next to him. Okay. The defendant is right up close. There's only one or two people closer, isn't that right? Uh, to the terms? I can't tell. Objection. Um, what do you define as close? Again, sir, you need to step down and get a closer look here. Do so. <coughs> so I understand close is a relative term. Let's let's say this. You are not with the defendant, right? Correct. Right. Not close. He, on the other hand, in comparison to this big group of people right here, he's way up here, correct? I believe so. Again, I can't tell from this, but I, I do recall from my trial that that was the general area. I believe I was somewhere right in right in here, and I believe he was right about here. Okay. So you were behind the defendant. <sighs> he was in front of you, and you're telling the jury you never even heard the tourist say anything. Correct. And you never heard anybody respond. I did not. You just all spontaneously decided <coughs> to start walking back to the parking area and go home. Yes, it was over at that time, uh, at the time that we walked away. I'm not sure what the time lapse was between that, but when we walked to the parking area, it was over. It was, well, it wasn't over, right? Because well, we, we considered it over, and we were going to leave. You considered it over, you were going to leave, yes. <laughs> but you didn't. You, a small group of you decided to circle out scratches again. So it wasn't over. Not after we entered the parking lot. Once we entered the parking lot, we did not go back around. Nobody went back around after this point? Like I said, I don't know what the time lapse was between this and the, <coughs> the point where we entered the parking lot planning to leave. I believe perhaps that we did go back around after that. I'm not certain. Oh. <clears throat> but we didn't, after we entered the parking lot, we did not go back.
was leaving, you said because you decided it was over, not because of anything that Tarek said, right? <coughs> Is that right? We're not we're not in the parking lot yet. Right, I know. <coughs> A bunch of you walk all the way down the road and then you're not in that group, are you? You don't know if you're in that group? The record, I'm going backwards now. Yes, it is. You were you weren't on the other side of the building, were you? At what point? Obviously we're going back with him. This person right here is you? Yes. Alright. So you guys did a... The defendant's not in that picture, right? No, I don't think so. Alright, so you and this small group did a, another lap around the building? I believe that is correct. Okay. I, I don't recall for sure, but I believe so. But you weren't on the other side of the building when the when the tourist was allegedly addressing the crowd. I don't believe so. At the trial, it was pointed out that I was in the crowd when the tourist was addressed. Well, let's forget about the trial. You know, let's just talk about your memory. Do you even remember? I do not remember the tourist addressing the crowd, so therefore I do not know where I was at the time, other than the video. If you can zoom in on the video, I can point out whether I was there when he was addressing the crowd. Well, you remember, do you even remember three officers standing in front of the crowd? I do. Uh, by the building, yes. I just want to make sure we're clear. You, you say that you were in this group. Yes, I believe if you zoom in, I believe I can verify that. Yeah, I think I see that. Perhaps.
and again we're still going backwards.
as I understand it, uh, Mr. Johnson, you're arresting, is that correct? That is correct. Uh, why don't we proceed with closing statements? Mr. Johnson. Well, I thank you for being patient. We haven't bored you too awfully. I tried to speed it up as much as I could. The, uh, I, the, uh, I guess the point is here is that they, if you believe I was told to leave the, the property and if I stayed on purpose. I did not hear any such order. So, uh, not to but uh, I would hope that you would embrace the largeness of uh, what uh, what I mentioned at the beginning of the trial and the representation. Uh, it was brought up to me that I insulted the judge by, by calling him uh, a brave eagle in the, German, in the German form of his word. I apologize if I did that, but I thought it was uh, great symbolism. And uh, Mr. Webb, if anybody derived that it, I called him a spider. <laughs> to apologize for that. And uh, I would hope that, uh, that find me not guilty, and uh, thank you very much for your time. Mr. Johnson, you approach me, Mr. Webb. Well. Ladies and gentlemen, just to make a brief comment on uh, Mr. Johnson's comment. Nobody in the court, including myself, made any comment that they thought Mr. Johnson was disrespectful. Uh, I don't think he was. I think he's handled himself uh, admirably today. Uh, so wherever that comment came from, it wasn't from any court personnel. Anyway. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your patience uh, in this case. I uh, just want to make a few points. The facility here was clearly marked. You heard 12 signs indicating that defiance of any order to leave is a misdemeanor. Uh, that was in contrast to the old jail. Also, you heard very clearly from the three officers that Sergeant Futuris gave a loud command or an order for them to leave. They all three agreed that it was a loud order uh, and that he repeated it and that the crowd responded to it, that they reacted as if they had heard, not only in their actions, but also by sort of yelling back at the officers. And their testimony was clear on that point, that they were given the order to leave and that the police were going to be called if they did not leave. Um, the state argues to you that the evidence shows that the defendant is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of criminal trespass. Is there a place in our society for protests, things of that nature? Sure, there is. But these, the defendant went beyond that. Uh, you saw the video of him going around the building. He had to pass through these signs. He went into the little alcove area. He went on the dirt on the end of the um, building. There are windows there. The, inmates are looking out. We can't have people traipsing around the outside of that building stirring up people on the inside. Um, the, the officer's testimony was clear about the order to leave. Mr. Troyer was way back in the crowd, assuming that you 
believe what he said, he wasn't even in a position like the defendant who was much closer to the front to hear. <coughs> Now, with respect to uh, an, the order, the, the law in the case, and again, the judge is going to instruct you on that, and his instructions control not my arguments. Okay? Um, the law says it's a, a misdemeanor, criminal trespass is a misdemeanor if the person knowingly enters or remains in any place, place and defines of an order to leave or not to enter, which was personally communicated to him by the owner or otherwise, other authorized person. The tourist, as the shift commander, is clearly an authorized person. Um, and so the question is, uh, if you find that the tourist gave this order to this group and the defendant heard, which the state argues the evidence shows, what does the word personally mean? You guys are going to have to decide common usage for that, what does personally mean. The state argues it does not mean individually. They did not have to go to every single person you have to leave, and then the next person and you have to leave. Personally means in person, and they were instructed in person, you all have to leave or we're calling the police. I told you at the beginning, it's not the case, uh, the, the case of the century, but it is criminal trespass, and so the state has to find the defendant guilty. As you know, ladies and gentlemen, the evidence and the arguments in this case have been completed. I will now instruct you on the law that applies in this case. You will then retire to, to decide a verdict. In order to reach a fair and just verdict, you must understand and follow the law as I explain it to you. For example, you have to understand the definition of the crime with which the defendant is charged. You have to understand how convinced one way or the other you should be before you reach a verdict. You have to understand what to consider in deciding whether to believe a particular witness. These instructions will explain the law as to these and other matters so that you can reach a fair and just verdict. It is your duty as jurors to follow all of the instructions that I'm about to give you. Regardless of any opinion you may have as to what the law ought to be, the law as I explain it to you is the law you must follow in reaching your verdict. It is up to you to decide the facts in this case. You must decide the facts solely from the evidence in this trial. You must apply the law given to you in these instructions to the facts and in this way reach a fair and just verdict. You should decide the facts in this case without prejudice, without fear, and without sympathy. You should decide this case based solely on the evidence presented and the law as I explain it to you. The fact that the defendant James Johnson has been charged or accused and brought to stand trial is not evidence of guilt. The complaint is simply a way of giving the defendant notice of the charge against him. The complaint is a formal way of accusing the defendant of the crime charge in order to bring him to trial. In your deliberations, you must not consider the fact of the defendant's complaint or the defendant being brought to stand trial as evidence of guilt to the defendant. The possible punishment of the defendant if you return a guilty verdict should not influence your decision. The duty of imposing sentence is for the judge. You should consider the evidence presented and base your verdict only on the evidence without considering the punishment. You have heard the state and Mr. Johnson discuss the facts and the law and their arguments to you. These arguments are not evidence. Their purpose is to help you <coughs> excuse me, understand the evidence and the law. If the state and Mr. Johnson have stated the law differently from the law as I explain it to you in these instructions, then you must follow these instructions and ignore the statements of the parties. If the parties have stated the evidence differently from how you recall it, then you should follow your own memory of what the evidence is. <coughs> During your deliberations, you should consider only the evidence in this case. The evidence from which you are to decide what the facts are in this case consists of the testimony and the oath of the witnesses, both on direct and cross-examination, regardless of who called the witness and exhibits which have been admitted into evidence. During the trial, Mr. Johnson and Attorney Webb made objections. The parties are supposed to object when they believe that certain evidence is not admissible. That's the job. They're not trying to hide anything from you. If I sustained an objection or excluded any evidence, you must not guess as to what the answer or evidence would have been. 
If I did allow some information to be entered as evidence after hearing objections by one of the parties, you are not to give such evidence any special importance as a result of my ruling. It is not my duty, and I certainly did not try to determine whether evidence was important when I made my ruling. If you believe that I have expressed or suggested an opinion as to the facts in this case, you should ignore such an opinion. The court in this case, as in all cases, is completely neutral and impartial. It is up to you alone to decide the facts in this case. In short, you should consider only the legally admissible evidence in deciding this case, that is, the testimony of the witnesses and the exhibits. There are two types of evidence, direct and circumstantial. Direct evidence is the testimony of a person who claims to have personal knowledge of facts about the crime charge, such as an eyewitness. Circumstantial evidence is proof of a chain of facts and circumstances which tend to show whether the defendant is guilty or not guilty. There is no distinction between the weight to be given either direct or circumstantial evidence. However, to be sufficient to establish guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, circumstantial evidence must exclude all other rational conclusions. This means that if from the circumstantial evidence it is rational to arrive at two conclusions, one consistent with guilt and one consistent with innocence, then you must choose the rational conclusion consistent with innocence. However, you do not consider each item of circumstantial evidence in isolation. In determining whether all other rational conclusions have been excluded, you should consider each item of circumstantial evidence in the context of all the other evidence, which includes all of the circumstantial and direct evidence. You should consider all the evidence in this case, including the circumstantial evidence, and decide whether the state has proved the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Under our constitutions, all defendants in criminal cases are presumed to be innocent and to have proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. The burden of proving guilt is entirely on the state. The defendant, James Johnson, does not have to prove his innocence. The defendant enters this courtroom as an innocent person, and you must consider him to be an innocent person until the state convinces you, beyond a reasonable doubt, that he is guilty of every element of the alleged offense. A person accused of an offense has an absolute right not to take the witness stand to testify. The fact that the defendant did not testify must not be considered by you in any way in deciding this case. The burden is on the state to prove the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. If, after all the evidence and arguments, you have a reasonable doubt as to the defendant having committed any one or more of the elements of the offense, then you must find him not guilty. A reasonable doubt is just what the words would ordinarily imply. The use of the word reasonable means simply that the doubt must be reasonable rather than unreasonable. It must be a doubt based on reason. It is not a frivolous or fanciful doubt, nor is it one that can easily be explained away. Rather, it is such a doubt based upon reason as remains after consideration of all the evidence that the state has offered against it. The test you must use is this. If you have a reasonable doubt as to whether the state has proved any one or more of the elements of the crime charge, you must find the defendant not guilty. However, if you find that the state has proved all of the elements of the offense charged beyond a reasonable doubt, you should find the defendant guilty. In reviewing the evidence, you should consider the quality of the evidence and not the quantity. It is not the number of witnesses or quantity of the evidence that is important, but the quality of the evidence that is important. In deciding whether the state has proved the charges against the defendant beyond a reasonable doubt, you must decide the credibility of witnesses. That is, that is, it is up to you to decide who to believe. If there is any conflict between the witnesses, then you must resolve the conflict and decide what the truth is. Simply because a witness has taken an oath to tell the truth does not mean you have to accept the testimony as true. You are the sole and exclusive judges of the facts, of the credibility of all of the witnesses who have testified in the trial of this case, and of the weight to be given to the testimony of each witness. In deciding which witnesses to believe, you should use your common sense and judgment. I suggest that you consider a number of factors. The witness's appearance, attitude, and behavior on the stand and the way the witness testified. The witness's age, intelligence, and experience. The witness's opportunity and ability to see or hear the things about which he or she testified. The accuracy of the witness's memory. Any motive of the witness not to tell the truth. Any interest that a witness had in the outcome of the case. Any bias of the witness or friendship or animosity the witness may have for or against any of the parties of the case. The consistency or inconsistency of the witness. 
whether or not what the witness has said appears reasonable or unreasonable, and whether what the witness said is consistent or inconsistent with the testimony of other witnesses. In deciding which witnesses to believe and how much of the testimony to believe, you should consider both the direct and cross-examination of the witness. You should consider these factors in deciding the credibility of all of the witnesses. In short, you should consider the testimony of each witness and give it the weight you think it deserves. You can accept all of what a witness has said, you can reject all of what a witness has said, or you can accept some of it and reject some of it. I will now instruct you as to the substantive law that applies in this case. The laws in New Hampshire set forth certain crimes. If it is not defined in the criminal code, it is not a crime. Each crime has a precise definition. The definition of each crime requires the state prove both that a defendant committed certain acts and that the defendant acted with a criminal intent. So all crimes have at least two parts in that, an action and an intention. In deciding whether a person is guilty of a crime, it is necessary for you to know both what a person's actions were and what the intentions were when the act was committed. The word intent, of course, refers to what a person mentally believes his physical acts will accomplish. The word act refers to a physical deed or action. For a person to be guilty of a crime, they must do both things. In other words, the defendant must mentally intended, must have mentally intended to do something that was criminal. He must physically act to do something that is criminal. Unless a defendant both intended and acted to do something that is defined as criminal, that person has not committed a crime. The matter of intention of the defendant's mental state is something that we will have to decide. The defendant is charged with criminal trespass. A person is guilty of criminal trespass if, knowing that he is not licensed or privileged to do so, he enters or remains in any place. Criminal trespass is a misdemeanor if a person knowingly enters or remains in any place in defiance of an order to leave or not to enter, which was personally communicated to him by the owner or other authorized person. The parties have stipulated to all the elements of this charge with the exception of whether an order to leave was personally communicated to the defendant. The sole issue, therefore, for you to decide in this case is whether Mr. Johnson was personally asked to leave the grounds of the Cheshire County House of Corrections. The state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Johnson was personally asked to leave. Personally is not a legal term, so please define it based on your own judgment and experience. This case is important to both of the parties, ladies and gentlemen, the state and Mr. Johnson. In your deliberations, you should follow these instructions which I have given to you. You should not decide this case out of bias or sympathy, but with honesty and with understanding. You should make a conscientious effort to determine what a fair and just result is in this case because that is your highest duty as officers of this court. Remember that your verdict must be unanimous, that is, all 12 of you must agree as to the result. Mr. Johnson, Mr. Webb, are you approved? Thank you. 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 Thank
as I have indicated, your verdict must be unanimous. That, that, that is, that all 12 of you must unanimously agree uh, as to the result. With that said, uh, I will excuse you to begin your deliberations. Thank you. Rise to the jury. The jury, Your Honor. Thank you. Please be seated. Uh, it's my understanding, ladies and gentlemen, that you're process of deliberations and, and uh, I'm not uh, able to conclude as I'm today with a unanimous decision. Uh, the court uh, closes at four. Uh, tomorrow is a uh, furlough day, so I wanted to tell you that uh, we will excuse you today and ask that you come back Monday morning at nine o'clock to continue the deliberations. But the real uh, that necessitated bringing you up to advise you that, that in light of the fact that this would be a three-day break for you, as I cautioned you at the outset of the case, you can't uh, discuss the case among yourselves with anybody at home. Uh, you can't expose yourself to any publicity to the extent there is any. The only evidence that you can consider in this case is what you hear in the courtroom. And that includes the cautionary comment I also made at the outset of the trial that you can't do any independent research through electronic devices or anything else that may occur to you that might influence your decision in this case. You can only consider what was presented to you in the court. Uh, so with that said, I wish you all a good weekend. Uh, please remember my cautionary instructions, and we will look for you Monday morning at 9 o'clock. Thank you. All rise. <coughs> Turn that off, please. Or else just step outside if you need to call. Thank you. Uh, you all may be seated with the exception of the purpose. <laughs> Case number 10-CR-887. Guilty. Guilty, you say? So say you all? Yes. 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 Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I will excuse you. Now do No victim, no crime. Google victim.
victim of crimes. Yeah. Can we quiet back there? Uh, stick with your good and sentence. Let me have a seat, Mr. Johnson. Um, Your Honor, if I may approach, I have a sentence sheet which is essentially blind.
hey, you gotta pay for the jail through taxes. You gotta pay if you go there. Jim, did they suspend the fine? No, as well? they didn't suspend the fine. <coughs> the, just the days. The Does that mean they're taking you to jail today? No. No, all the jail time has been suspended. But you're not paying the fine either, right? Okay, let's go. Yeah. Both. We got other hearings to do. We let's go. I'll go as soon as he leaves. Yeah. You can free to leave right now, and you can leave right now also. <coughs> you can treat people nicer. You treat. You're treated. So have a great day. Yeah, I assume what's, you're. What's your name? My name's Jim. Hi, Jim. I'm Ian. Ian, I, I assume that you're sort of affiliated with the defendant in the case. Yes, Is that sir. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I only got a few minutes, but sure. I'm happy. Two's fine. Um, what happened in there? In the jury? Yeah. So we were eight four on Friday. And eight four? Yeah. And eight, eight for guilty, eight, yeah, four against. Yeah. And then on the weekend, we uh, well, some people changed their mind, and uh, we went to unanimous pretty quickly in the morning. Jesus Christ. Did they explain the why that they changed their mind? Well, I, I think people were hung up on the personally thing. Uh, on the personally? Yeah, that, that, that wasn't my personal concern, but a, a lot of people were hung up on what, because personally can mean one-on-one, -on -one, but in this context, it probably didn't. And I think people thought that by the letter of the law, he was guilty. Did anyone take the jury nullification information into a uh, factor? Did you it receive that information? It wasn't discussed. I thought, I actually didn't read that pamphlet, but mm -hmm. I've heard about it, I've like read about it. And, and I, I didn't read it. I, I typically think of uh, jury nullification as coming into play when there's when we believe that there's an unjust law. You know, for example, for marijuana possession or something like that. Okay. You, you just think it's bullshit. You, you, pardon me. That's okay. <laughs> um, uh, you, so you marijuana might, possession, you would have found like if it were a marijuana I, I, case, I very you would have well found may not guilty. For example. Um, but walking around the jail, um, that felt like. Well, wrong. yeah, I, I thought I thought the trespassing law. It's, it, itself as a just law, but believe me, I gave a lot of thought to this. I, I don't think you should have been arrested in the first place, to be perfectly honest with you. But when you when you look at the letter of the law, uh, I, I, I do believe that the officer at the prison communicated the order to leave personally, and that order was violated. So by letter of the law, he was gil guilty, and I was, it, it's, Were you in one some of the ways, up? Excuse me. No, I was not, but I, I was uh, I was a bit torn on the issue, mm. for sure. And uh, I, I would have I would have been feeling a whole lot worse right now if he got an actual jail sentence. That's for sure. I did not want. Did they tell you anyone. what the sentence was back there? Yeah, I asked. Okay. I asked. Uh, and I really want to look up over the weekend, like what the possible consequences were, but we're told we shouldn't, so I didn't. Right. He did Could not have been get up to a year. He, yeah, that that would have been. I, I think that would have been awful. So you feel like he never should have been arrested in the first place. Well, I think but he, because it was he was a judgment was. call on the part of the police mm -hmm. for sure. Did you feel I, it was I hasty? I think he didn't let him go. Did you feel it was hasty on the police's part to just walk up and arrest people without even giving them a warning first? I, I felt like the, I don't know what happened there because they didn't say, yeah, I figured yeah. maybe you were. I wasn't there. They didn't describe exactly what happened in that parking lot, but if it was me, and I'm not a police officer, so maybe he, know, he probably knows what he's doing better than me, but you probably, I, if I were him, I probably would have said, you guys better get out of here or I'm going to arrest you. That's usually how they do it. Typically, yeah. they'll come and they'll say, hey, you know, we don't want to arrest you, so can you take off? And then people leave. And in this case, they just came and sw swooped us up. Yeah, no, I'm fully aware that basically the crime here is taking one last lap around that, yeah. that jail. And it seems kind of minor, and they could have let it go. Uh, but Did you didn't. find it interesting that uh, there were several things that were similar at the old jail that they hadn't um, messed with? I hadn't given much that much thought because I, I didn't know anything about the old jail right. and it just wasn't discussed much. Um, so anyway, I hope there are How no do you more. Feel about, like nobody, there was no proof on the state side of actually him hearing the order. Like, I mean, I know the order might have been given, but did he, like there's no proof in the trial that he was actually heard the order. I've been sitting right next to people who have said something, but due to being having attention elsewhere, 
Like haven't heard somebody say something right next to I me. I think there is a small chance he didn't get the order, but it's just very small. I, I didn't think I could, it rose to the level of like well, a reasonable reason, doubt. A reasonable doubt there wasn't? Well, I mean, there, there were a couple of people who thought it also at first right. that there was reasonable doubt there. And I, I understand their point of view. And, and there's, an, there's an argument to be made there, but I, I thought in the end, Man, he he was right there. The whole, the fact that the whole, the sure. way the whole crowd reacted and were leaving, he had day. to know that an order was given for the for them to go. But then for me personally, the next question would be like, public property. We're all forced to pay for that property. Therefore, we should be able to use it and peacefully protest anywhere. I mean, this is, you know, the Constitution says you can peacefully assemble to protest anything I mean, anywhere that, on public property. I mean, that's another issue. Unfortunately, that didn't that didn't become. That really wasn't discussed much during yeah, the trial. Should that have been brought up, do you think? Well, I'm not a lawyer. And all that? I, I'm not a lawyer, so I, I can't say. But it, it really wasn't discussed during the trial. And so I, I didn't really know. I mean, so I, I just went by. I just. on public property every weekend. Yeah, and I think they should be able to do that. Right. I mean, you, the, the park property me, and the jail property ride. are the same. You know, they're both public property. Yeah, but, but I, I know, you're right. But uh, I mean, there's public property in it. All I can go by is I know there's public property in the U.S. that you're just not allowed to just walk onto. You can't just walk onto an Air Force base or something like that. They put fences there up the there, order. right? Like they, they do. Try to keep they, you out. We did talk about this. They should have. If they really don't want people walking around there, they should put a fence up. Right. Uh, How can they call it secure if there's no fence or yeah. anything like that? Yeah, the yeah, building's exactly. clearly secure. You can't get in. Exactly. But the rest. I don't want to hold you up anymore. Yeah, Thank yeah, you so much. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate your time. Uh, good luck, man. I Thank you, sir. Too. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for talking with us. Take care, bud. Appreciate it. Hey, guys. Yeah, I, I, I know this didn't go the way you guys wanted to. What? So. Because you had an effect. Like, you had a... You were, one person being close is good enough, you know. I mean, that's that's yeah. enough. To, I mean, next. Good time to know that you're with us on the marijuana thing. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. This is probably going to end up on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> All right, see Take ya. it easy. Bye now. We'd like to invite you to visit freekeen.com. Freekeen.com features audio, video, and blogs chronicling the transition to a voluntary society. Freekeen.com also has comments and discussion forums so you can be heard. Freekeen.com. I should be in Keene, New Hampshire with the Free Staters.